This week's The World Today will examine Japan's growing and ever-evolving leadership role in the Indo-Pacific and its re-emergence on the world stage, in part due to the leadership and policies of the late former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo. At this time, I'd like to introduce and welcome our guests to the stage. Ambassador Mikio Mori currently serves as the Council General of the Consulate General of Japan in New York. Previously, he served as First Secretary in Bonn and Counselor Head of Chancellery in Singapore, among many other diplomatic roles. Second, Nobukatsu Kanehara is a professor in Doshisha University's Department of Political Science. He served as Assistant Chief Cabinet Secretary of Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe from 2012 to 2019. He is a joint fellow with Perry Roldhouse and the Center for East Asian Studies this academic year. Last but not least, our moderator today is Dr. Frederick Dickinson, who is a professor of Japanese history and the director of the Center for East Asian Studies here at Penn. I welcome them to the stage. Thank you. So I guess that's my cue to begin, Tom, yes. Thank you. Um, um, I am Fred Dickinson, uh, the uh, Center for East Asian Studies Director, and I will be the moderator uh, today. And I do want to, before we start, uh, give a big shout out to Perry World House, our partner in this uh, endeavor. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of the regular programming here at the World Today. Um, you know, as you may know, Perry World House is the center of sort of international uh, studies at Penn. And, we're delighted that uh, this special program is focused on Japan. Uh, I do also want to um, give a shout out to the Japan Foundation, which is uh, in part responsible with its institutional project support grant uh, for bringing uh, Mr. Kanehara uh, here for a full week, uh, both as a visiting fellow at Perry World House and at uh, the Center for East Asian Studies, the Japan Foundation fellow. So we could not do it without the support of the Japan Foundation. Uh, last but not least, our, our good friends from the uh, Consul General uh, of Japan in, in New York, particularly for, um, um, Ambassador Mori, uh, who is a already, he's only been here for a, a year in, in New York, but he's already an old time, an old timer on campus, and we hope to see him. This is his second official um, uh, appearance, but we hope to see uh, much more uh, of him um, in the next few years. Uh, so uh, I'm just a historian, and so uh, you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to these uh, two eminent gentlemen. What uh, what Lashan did not uh, necessarily mention was that they um, so they're both adept at diplomacy and politics, and in fact, they both work together uh, in the Abe administration in the new national security uh, apparatus. Was that was that the story? So they are particularly uh, sort of appropriate uh, interlocutors in thinking about Japan, uh, Abe, and, and post Abe, and what is uh, the world and Japan bring us after after Abe. So I'm particularly uh, excited about this program today. And just, just for those of you, I mean, I presume you are here and you know Abe's um, uh, significance, but he is, of course, the longest serving prime minister in the history of Japan uh, and one of the most influential uh, prime ministers uh, in modern Japan. And so his uh, tragic loss last summer obviously raised very important questions about, okay, wither, wither Japan, wither, wither East Asia, and hopefully we'll be we getting to those uh, big issues uh, today. So uh, again, without further ado, I would just like to um, yield the floor first uh, to uh, Mr. Kanehara to perhaps give us some opening uh, remarks, and then we'll um, do about 20 minutes, uh, then we'll go to the ambassador, uh, we'll have about a 20 minute discussion amongst uh, ourselves, and then we'll open it to the floor. So uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us a, a little bit of your ideas about Abe, uh, that would be great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Abe-san's greatest legacy is the free and open in the Pacific idea. And he launched this idea. The basic idea is that the, the sort of liberal international order born over the Atlantic and came with the Pan Pacific. Now we have to incorporate Indian Ocean, in particular India. That is the basic idea. The, the, in this in these efforts, we can make a global liberal international order, having Indians as a new pillar. And this is his basic idea. And the 
the long, long time ago, the, there was only on, only one one continent called the Pangaea, right? And we have five continents. The Chinggis Khan penetrated by horse the continents, and Europeans spread by by ship, and they connected the whole world. Now we are connected by internet. Now we're truly having one community here. We do share some basic important ethical emotions like love, compassion, and so we put the, I like it, to the photo of Facebook. There are the mother cats taking care of the kids, kittens. And we do share common, common, very common emotions here. And we can build a, a new liberal international order. But for that purpose, we have to make efforts. This order is not free. We earned this by a huge amount of bloodshed and cost the last centuries. There were two big wars, racial discriminations, colonial rules were rampant in the last century. All of these things were swept away. We had many great leaders, of course, the political leaders, but we have all the saints too, the like Gandhi, Reverend the King. They put down the discriminations and colonial rules and where we are. And this order is precious that we have to protect. Now we have challenges here. In particular, this, this time China is rising up. Putin is having a very stupid war. He'll be defeated. And then China rises. We have to engage China so that China does not repeat the same mistake as Putin. China might invade Taiwan. We have to dissuade them. Taiwan is a free island. And Taiwan, nobody can say that we're going we're gonna to surrender Australia to China, right? But Taiwan has the same population as Australia, 23 million. Taiwan's economy is as big as Australia. They, are 20, they, they can be G20 members. And they're totally free nations. After 1996, they're totally democratized. They're part of us. We cannot surrender them. And China has nothing to complain about. We are, they are living in a free world, free trade, permanent seat and security council. They are respected. They should be engaged by us. As far as the West is engaged, we are far bigger than China. When West is in disarray, we are going to surrender one, one by one. But as far as the West is united, we can beat Putin and we can engage China. We can avoid a war over Taiwan. After 20 years, China peaks out. India stands up. Indians are, the Indians will surpass the size of China in terms of population this year, 1.4 billion. They are 10 years younger than Chinese. They are 20 years younger than Japanese. Amazing, isn't it? And the India is stand up. India is a born democracy. They can make difficulties for us when they are very big, but they'll never fight a war against us. We should ask them to support this liberal order with us. Then we'll be okay towards the mid-century of this 21st century. Thank you very much. Great. So essentially, a uh, free and open Indo-Pacific is the main, uh, according to Mr. Kanahara, the legacy of, of Abe Shinzo. And that, uh, we, we should say, it was articulated 2007. Is that, is that correct? Just, I'm, I'm the historian, so I just want to date for that. In 2007, he made a speech, he a, he made a speech in, in India. India. Yeah. And he said two oceans, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean, should be, should, be, should be combined. Right. And the leaders should be Japan and India. And Indians are so happy to hear that. I have to say, India is a born democracy, right? The Gandhi and Nehru made this nation. But when we took hands of Mao, dictator, to face Russians, Indians are very angry because they are their democracy. But India had to face Chinese. China invaded India in 1962. India never can, can never forget this. When Japan and the United States joined the camp of China, India had to go to Moscow to buy arms. They are not very happy. Now, China is confronting the West, and the Russia is falling down. India cannot say bye-bye very quickly to Russia, but they are steadily changing the positions. They are coming towards us. And this is the moment to take hands of Indians. And Indians were ready. So in 2007, he, Abe made a speech in, in the parliament of India, Delhi, the whole parliament is so excited. They never heard of this kind of message. We're waiting for you, he said. And Indians are very much moved. And since then, it was Prime Minister Shin, Congress. So he was a bit slow, but with Modi, the move is very fast. 
Now we have to incorporate them, Indians, as a new partner to sustain this liberal order. Okay. Uh, Ambassador, would you like to comment on what you think is the most important legacy of uh, Abe Shinzo? Yes, uh, indeed, it is uh, always a privilege to be invited uh, to the Perry World House. And it is, I've been working with Kanehara san for the last 30 years. It is, I feel always underprivileged to speak after Kanehara san because <laughs> nothing is missed, missed there, of course. Uh, and uh, I, I cannot speak as, uh, as much colorful as he does. But uh, yes, uh, Abe san achieved many, many things. Uh, and of course, free and open uh, Indo-Pacific is a very important concept, which, which has become foundation of many other ideas, such as Quad or, or AUKUS uh, or, or, or J Japanese, uh, Japan, Australia cooperation, uh, very close uh, military cooperation amongst the Southeast Asian uh, states and Japan and the U.S. Uh, many, many things has been achieved in Abe-san's eight years. And uh, as uh, was uh, introduced by uh, Fred, uh, I had the privilege of working uh, in Abe-san's office uh, just for two years. But in the case with Kanehara-san, he was with uh, Prime Minister Abe for five years with a much more important position. So I really look forward to hearing uh, from uh, uh, the discussion uh, from Professor Kanehara uh, about what would be the implication of this important uh, legacy uh, Abe-san left uh, to the current Japan, current Japan-US relations, and uh, the current world. Great, thank you. So uh, we will segue now, in, on per perfect timing, by the way, uh, into our 20-minute uh, sort of discussion amongst ourselves. And if I could um, just throw out there, you know, we've been talking st strategy and we'll continue to talk, stock, talk strategy, no doubt. Uh, but it is the case also that uh, uh, Abe, although uh, had many sort of strategic accomplishments and is heralded in many uh, corners uh, of the uh, globe, uh, he also in some ways is a controversial figure in uh, Japan. I wonder if you could speak to that controversy and whether that has anything to do with a possible legacy uh, either disappearing or expanding or whatever. And we'll start with you again, uh, Kanehara-san. Um, for me, the Abe-san and the previous Fanoda-san, the Democrat Prime Minister, these two are the first Prime Ministers of my generation. And Japan is heavily generationally divided. I have to have three generations, the imperial age people, right, Americans. And then the very much leftist people admire Stalin, Lenin, very much leftist people. It's say uh, in their 70s and 80s today, imperial people 90s. And below that, it's, it's my generation. We are like, say, Americans. Uh, my previous generation was singing the Russian songs. And we are singing in Bob Dylan, Beatles, <laughs> Zero, and bell bottom jeans, and long hair. And it was very much influenced by the American liberalism. And that, that's, that's us. And the Japan was a particular nation because the previous generations were very much divided. Japan was not divided like Korea, Vietnam, China, Germany, they were divided. Japan was not divided, but inside Japan was totally divided. We have the socialist communists, they swore allegiance to Moscow. This is not the case of West Germany. But the case the, in Japan, we were neutralized because the parliament was completely divided. We couldn't set a consensus for national policy. And Yoshida Kishi, the prime minister, chose the Western camp. But after that, Japan had great difficulties to go to the West. It's only after Nakasone, he, he was a good, great part of President Reagan after Afghan invasion by Soviet, we stood by, by the Americans, but Nakasone was, right? was heavily criticized. And then when the 1991 Soviet Union collapsed, and then Japan started to move gradually towards the West in the true sense of the word. And Abe is the first prime minister who, who defies the previous generations. We are in the West. We are, we are liberal. We're proud of that. What's wrong with liberalism and capitalism? What's wrong with being with Americans, with the, with the Westerners? And he was fighting against the previous generations. 
and he was very much bogged down by the, by the leftists. He took the whole leftist generation against him, but he wanted to change. And we have to stand up. We have to assert our values. What's wrong with it? It's not, on, it's not only about money. It's the values, the military, military, military contributions. We have to do everything. This is Abe was first say, first in saying that. And so Abe was a challenger to the status quo. And he invited the whole enemy of the old Japan. And sorry, he was assassinated. But the uh, what he started to break is the new Japan. So Ambassador, when you were working for the cabinet, did you feel or did you confront this sort of political issue in any way? That is the controversy surrounding, or was that this is not not part of your experience well uh first of all uh, i worked with uh, uh abe san uh, but uh, i'm actually four years younger than kanehara san so i was uh, not exactly abe san's generation but uh, <laughs> but, you're, but you're younger than the leftists right is that right exactly exactly uh but with that difference uh, i i feel, felt almost the same way and if there is any uh, negative legacy he left after he left the post and after after he he left japan uh, for for good uh was uh, i think he he was able to achieve many things many things his predecessors were not able to uh, but that left nothing nothing much to his successors so in current Japanese politics, there's nobody uh, who can take over what Abe-san has started uh, completely. Of course, uh, uh, both former Prime Minister Suga and uh, current Prime Minister Kishida is making the best effort. But it is, it is quite difficult, honestly, to catch up with what Abe-san was trying to achieve. That's one thing. That's very interesting. Did, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, security policy-wise, the Abe-san's roadmap is, is steadily implemented by Suga-san and Kishida-san today. What Abe-san did is he did one, he changed the constitutional framework. Before that, we were saying that we could help Americans in combats in Korea and Taiwan, but we, we, engage, we can engage forces, but in non-combat operations, that was our stance. Since 1999, uh, Prime Minister Obuchi said that, so we followed this. Abe said, no, no, we should join the combat operation from the beginning in the war in Taiwan or Korea in the Philippines. That, that's enhanced our deterrence as alliance. That's what Abe said. And Abe-san increased the maybe less than 20% of military budgets. It's nothing in comparison with the huge military budget of China. Now, Kishida-san, so, so Abe-san laid down the framework, the legal framework, Right, a strategic framework, but we had to expand our military forces capabilities. Otherwise, it's nothing. It's just cake in in a, in a picture, right? You can't eat it. Chisasan is amazingly doubling our military budget. This is far beyond the achievement of Abesan. If we double the military budgets, our military budget is as big as Germany, France, UK. Military forces two hundred fifty thousand the size of, say, France, UK, and Germany, we are a medium-sized nation, and we have modest military power and military budgets. If we double this, we're going to surpass Russia, India, and Saudi Arabia. We are just after US, China, and Japan. Our military budget would be the, the third largest one on Earth. It's far smaller than China still, but if we combine our budget force with the Americans, we can truly enhance the deterrence of our alliance. And this is necessary to keep a balance with China. So Kishida-san is doing his job. And this is much more than what Abe-san did as far as the budget is concerned. That's very interesting. On the one hand, so uh, if I understand correctly, Mr. Kanehara, so you see that Japanese politics, which has been fairly turbulent in the post-war era, is actually working to the benefit of stability now because there's a generational change, right? So that right. that's that's so your answer to is that going to be a problem is that no, that's not going to be a problem. We're in a better position politically 
within Japan than we were, say, 10 or 20 years ago, correct? Absolutely, because the, after the war, the Yoshida Kishida chose the Western side, right? Yep. But they invited huge opposition from communists and socialists. And 1950s, 60s, leftists are very strong in Japan. And so Japan could not move since then. And militarily, we did nothing, dependent upon the Americans. After the economic growth of Japan, Americans started to say, Japan is a three rider. And then we struggled to expand our military uh, contributions, peacekeeping operations, or the possible help for the Korean contingency. And when the 9-11 happened in, 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 in the States, Koizumi, the prime minister said, he saw NATO is mobilized. So he sent five warships to help American, American fleet in the Indian Ocean for attacking Afghanistan from the Indian Ocean. We participated in the war. And we steadily changed. And Abe-san is the, the last push. And so after, in particular, after 19, 1991, when Soviet Union collapsed, our domestic court war is over. Our domestic politics makes it easier for the governments to move as a member of the West. So it's steadily changing. So uh, it, it, part of my job today is to get you and, and the ambassador to argue against each other. So, so if, <laughs> if I may, uh, uh, um, Ambassador Mori just said earlier that there's no, there's no one like Abe and there's a, sort of a leadership vacuum. On the other hand, you just said Kishida is actually doing a great job. So please discuss. Uh, <laughs> Kishida-san is not... Like the personality is changed, personality is different. Abe commanded 100 army in the parliament. Our system is a British system. The prime minister has power basis in the parliament, not upon the people. So you have to have have 700 parliamentaries in our in our diet. You have to have four or five hundred followers, right? Abe had had 100 followers. Abe faction, very strong. 400 LDP, but he had five, well, 100. He still has 50. So he has to be more careful to make a balance inside the party. That does not mean he's a weak leader. Abe san is a strong leader, but Kishida san cannot be as bold as Abe. Of course, he has to listen to many people. But he does not, he does not dodge responsibilities. He's slow to take decisions than Abe, slower, of course. But he takes decisions. He decided to double the military budget. This is something that Abe could not do. Kishida open, Kishida decided to open our nuclear power plants for generations of the electricity. This is something that Abe could not do. So he's he is he's slow to decide, but he is steadily taking major decisions. And I don't think that the uh Kisa san will be okay. I mean, some say Kisa san would leave the government sooner or later. I don't think so. He'll have Hiroshima summit this year. He might go to elections this year. If he wins, he will continue several more years. In Japan, if the prime minister stays three years or five years, he's a great prime minister. <laughs> Ambassador, do you want to jump in? <laughs> My good friend, Fred, if, if it's your intention to, to have us uh, argue each other, <laughs> your intention will, will be fail. <laughs> but uh, uh, just like uh, uh, Professor Kanehara said, um, they are different. But and uh, uh, what Abe-san was able to achieve, probably Kishida-san should be able to complete, but not in the same way, uh, because of uh, the political inner uh, inner uh, party support. Uh, Kishida-san or, or Abe-san had, they're very different in quality, not only in quantity. So uh, Kishida-san will have to uh, find his own way how to pursue the political goal uh, he has. And uh, I can guarantee that uh, they share the same political goals, but uh, uh, the, the avenue should be quite different. So if I can uh, interpret then the consensus that you're trying to build amongst yourselves is, 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 is it's the idea that uh, uh, Kish Kishida is, is in, a, in a particular position 
uh, to accomplish uh, things, but may not be doing it in the way that Abe did it. Okay, I understand that. Um, but it, it's, it still begs the question when you were saying earlier, uh, Mr. Kanahara, uh, about uh, the, one of the biggest differences between Kishida and Abe, that is the political uh, sort of support issue. Um, what is the likelihood? Uh, so I, I understand why you give him sort of high marks for saying, okay, double the defense budget. But what is the likelihood that that's going to happen anytime soon, uh, given that uh, uh, Kishida does not have the political mm, power or energy that uh, Abe did? Yeah, that's the that's depends upon the composition of the, the government. It's, it's, it's our system, it's the British system, right? Abe had 100 followers, and Aso was his principal ally. He, had, he commanded 50. And then Nikai commanded 50, so it's 200 already. It's a huge army. And then the, the Motegi-san, the ex-foreign minister, chief, now the chief uh, secretary of the party, 50, supported him. So everybody was supported, supporting Abe. This, this made the 400 army in the, in the, in the diets, a very strong army. So he didn't, he didn't fear, fear anything. The, the, leftist, the leftist attack was fierce, but he just he said, I, 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 I'm okay, he was saying, I'm okay. The supporting ratio dropped so, sometimes 10 points, but he was laughing. Just, just wait to two weeks, I'll be okay. And then supporting ratio went back. He was very confident of the people's support. He was confident of the forward support and diets. Kishida-san's faction is 50. Hi. <laughs> So he has he has to his his mainstream is Kishida fifty, Aso fifty, and Motegi fifty. So one hundred fifty, right? And he has he was in alliance with Abe's faction one hundred. So Kishida was very strong, but Abe San died. So this Abe faction one hundred must be taken care of directly by Kishida San. So this is a delicate part. So Kishida San cannot go to the sort of Davish side, because he has to take care of the 100 Hawks people, the Abe's followers. There's no strong leader here, not yet. Well, that in part explains why he has been fairly energetic about following most of Abe's uh, yeah, legacy, course. right? Because if, it's a political... Mm, before, abe -san was doing that. kisa -san said, okay, I, I, I'm okay, I'm okay. He was saying that. But now he has to lead this Western, with, with the, the right-wing people too. Right. He's a leader of both sides, left wing, right wing. Of course, but Kishida is not exactly Abe, right? Even in terms of policy. And so I'm very interested in particular uh, with some of the differences. For, for instance, uh, in, in response to the Ukraine um, uh, sort of de debacle last February, uh, Abe-san came out with a strong declaration, for instance, that uh, Japan should host uh, U.S. nuclear weapons, uh, and uh, and uh, Kanehara's response. Uh, I'm sorry, not Kanehara. Uh, uh, Kishida's response to that was no, no way. Uh, is that is that a factor? Does that give an inkling of what um, uh, maybe a a, a a specific Kishida uh, flavor to strategy that might be different than Abe? Uh, well, first of all. Uh, although uh, Kanehara-san is a retired diplomat, I'm still incumbent. So I, I cannot say uh, too many things <laughs> to talk about uh, politics or <laughs> uh, political future of Japan. But uh, as I said, uh, they have different political assets within the party and difficult group of uh, uh, politicians supporting uh, respective uh, uh, prime minister's ideas. Uh, and when it comes to uh, prime minister Abe, uh, there are more uh, nationalistic, uh, right, rightish uh, LDP politicians who had support. On the other hand, uh, uh, Kishida-san's uh, uh, support base is uh, uh, Kochikai, uh, who is supposed to be seeking more on, on the peaceful side. So there are some difference when, when it comes to uh, the uh, internal party support. That's why this debate about uh, nuclear position or not, uh, 
would happen. But more precisely speaking, what Fred just said is not uh, exactly precise. Kishida-san is, uh, of course, against possession of nuclear power. But the debate there was uh, actually whether we should uh, uh, introduce the discussion on so-called nuclear sharing. Nuclear sharing is not necessarily possession of the nuclear arsenal themselves. Uh, the nuclear debate is a very, very, very delicate debate in Japan because Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and this long time it was taboo to touch it. But now China is rising. They have a huge number of intermediate range missiles and many are nuclear headed. And Americans have no intermediate range nuclear missiles around the base. And the Americans are now reintroducing these intermediate range random based nuclear missiles. They have to put it somewhere because they, they can shoot China from California. They have to bring them into, say, Korea, Japan, or the Philippines. And Koreans are now discussing this very seriously. Whereas nuclear option is now zero, but introducing American nukes is an option. Now we have to start discussing that. That was Abe-san's intention. Let's start discussing this. Germans were discussing this for uh, 70 years. Koreans want to discuss that now, that we should join the debate. That's Abe. Shida-san was in trouble because he is from Hiroshima. His hometown is Hiroshima. He can't say, we should share nukes with Americans. Please don't do that, he said. <laughs> he, he can't start discussions. And because Abe-san died, this discussion was, was out of the focus now. Now, Kishida-san will say in Hiroshima, next summit will be in Hiroshima, he will denounce Putin's nuclear threat. And he will do this. But whether we should introduce American nukes in Japan or not, this is not on the agenda. But in Seoul, Koreans are discussing this very seriously. Great. Well, that's that brings us exactly to our uh, the next phase of our uh, program, which is a, a question and answer with you guys in the audience. So I will open the floor, and I would just request, um, and the floor is open online as well. But I would just request that uh, when you go up, oh, I guess the mic is over there. Uh, when you go up to the mic, just uh, introduce yourself and tell us who you are uh, before you uh, answer or ask your very brief. A, a question with a question mark. I think that's what LaShawn said, right? Got it. Okay, so the floor is open. If you don't, okay, here we go. Yeah. Lou, um, in, uh, oh, I'm Gerhard. In the uh, mid 90s, uh, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, and it's unclear that Russia would have invaded now had they still had them. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm wondering, for the region of East Asia, do you uh, do you see the uh, potential deterrence, or what do you see the role over the longer term uh, of of nuclear deterrence? China. Nuclear deterrence is absolutely necessary because China has nuclear weapons, Russia has nuclear weapons, and North Koreans have nuclear weapons. We have to deter them. To deter them, nukes can be deterred only by nuclear weapons. We can deter them with conventional weapons. So American nuclear weapons are absolute necessity for us. But if we go with details of discussions, China has intermediate, intermediate range missiles a lot. The warheads can be nuclear. And North Koreans have the same thing. Americans has none. They have they have the the air to soil nuclear missiles. That's okay, but the land based nuclear missiles, Americans don't have that. So there's a mystery gap here. And the so the the uh, frontal nations are Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. And if the nuclear escalation starts, how Americans would react? We ask Americans to just say to Chinese, if you use nukes the U.S. Will use, will use nukes again, we shoot back. But the, is it enough if China shoots the shorter range missiles against Tokyo or Taipei? 
will the United States should, should, will the United States shoot back? Maybe not. Maybe we should fill this gap somehow. And this is serious debate. And we should discuss this now. And Koreans start the debate now. This and they are, I'm sorry, but Kishida san is from, from Hiroshima. <laughs> he can't do this. But at the outside, the outside the government, I, I started the debate. I wrote a big book about this. And we should start debates on nuclear issues now. But it's before it's too late. We have to do that. Ambassador, you want to add something? Well, again, there's nothing much to add on what Kanehara san said, but uh, I've been actually not only a colleague of Kanehara san, but students of Kanehara san for 30 years. So I know what, what Kanehara san should have missed. Uh, in order to achieve nuclear deterrence, there should be a certain level of mutual respect of each other. Uh, for example, between uh, Japan, uh, the US, and Soviet Union. But in the current East Asian situation, it is very difficult to talk about the mutual, uh, mutual recognition or mutual respect, uh, trust each other. Uh, uh, when the other said, you, we have nuclear weapon, we should attack if you go ahead. That kind of debate is not uh, existing in, in current East, East Asia. Because of first North Korea, you don't you don't you don't know what they really possess or what the real intention of North Korea, and even when it comes to uh, U.S. China, uh, there is a serious lack of uh, mistrust, uh, lack of trust between uh, Beijing and America when it comes to their respective nuclear strategy. So, or uh, when when it comes to nuclear deterrence in a, a really academic and historical uh, sense, uh, it is very hard to find in the current East Asia. I would say. Great. I'd like to switch gears a little bit. We have an online question that says, "How do you see Japanese economic policy shifting in the new political environment that we were describing before?" So, switching to the issue of economics. Is there any uh, sort of le legacy that is? Economy is the only one domain where Abe san could not achieve his ambition. He wanted to galvanize against the Japanese economy. And he started to, he, 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 he was successful in picking, uh, picking up Japan's economy. Before him, Tokyo Nikkei was 8,000 yen. After he took office, Tokyo Nikkei went up to 30. 30,000 yen, the stock, stock market. And unemployment reduced massively. And suicide number went down by 10,000. Usually, Japanese people die 20,000 commit suicide. When the economy is very bad, the number goes up to 30,000. When after they took power, the number went down to 20,000. So it was on surface, it was OK. But it was only stock market. We had to have, we have to go through structural change, you know, GX or DX, and we have to we have to galvanize whole economy. But we couldn't do that, not yet. Japan's economy is still very slow, not very much exciting, right? Now that this is coming now, DX and GX, finally. But we have to push this forward. Otherwise, we are in decline this way. We are okay up to 1980s, right? And then started to slow down. Now it's in, that, that's in decline. But the youngsters are very angry. And we have to change labor markets, customs, and stupid lifetime employment. And now we are saying the, the, the youngsters are saying that the, you know, salaryman in Japan, they are, the, they are not the vassals, they are animals, they say. They're tamed, they're trained in the company. They can't develop their own skill. And age of 50, they're fired and they become industrial waste. And Japanese youngsters are very angry against this. Now many youngsters are abandoning Japan. They are finding jobs in the foreign companies like McKinsey. And we have to change everything. Labor, labor markets, labor custom, and employment system, and introdu introducing new green technology and digital technology. We have to change the whole picture of Japanese economy. And I think it's coming. Investors, is the foreign ministry losing youngsters? Well, um, 
as Kanehara san said, uh, Japan is fa facing the quite big, uh, difficult time. And in that sense, it is not quite fair to compare, uh, for example, Abe san's economic policy and Kishida san's political uh, economic policy at this point, because uh, background are quite different. Uh, Japan is losing global status. Uh, Japan is losing even presence in, in the United States compared to Abe san's time or earlier in this century. Uh, but uh, the common purpose of economic policy of both uh, Prime Minister Kishida and late Prime Minister Abe is how to revitalize Japan's economy and how to bring back uh, the, the status of, of Japan into uh, the global arena. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, Abe-san took the method of uh, Abenomics and Kishida-san is seeking different avenue called the uh, new form of uh, capitalism. But uh, what they are trying to achieve are not uh, very different. So uh, first, it is very difficult to compare. But second, uh, we are, uh, I mean, they are uh, looking the same direction. Great. Okay. Soyoung, you want to introduce yourself and ask a question? Yes. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Soyoung. I'm a graduate student at the um, School of Education here at the University of Pennsylvania. It's good to see you again. Um, uh, and good to see you again too, um, Mori san, and good to see you again too, uh, Fred, Fred sang. Oh, good to see you. Um, my question is it's a slight pivot from the main discussion, perhaps, but I think integral to this current discussion and the themes that you've all touched upon. Um, so my understanding of this discussion is that there is a misbalance or an unbalanced nature in the current global economic order. Um, and Japan is a huge player in this arena. Um, I'd like to know more about your experience and your how your experiences in government, in politics, have informed how you treat your female colleagues, granddaughters, daughters, women in general. Um, yes, anyone who, anyone whom you perceive to be not your gender or sex. I hope the question's clear. Yeah, yeah. Japan, Japan, Japan is changing. Uh, my my wife was uh, my my wife is classmate, Tokyo University, and she in the winter semester sophomore she got the highest score among the all students at Tokyo University, and she wanted to, she wanted professor. She is not she's international professor. She wanted professor in Tokyo University, but she was ousted. She was simply ousted because she's a woman. No woman can be a professor in Tokyo University, she was told, and she was ousted. And she, she, so she found her job in a small university herself, and she became in the end the president of the International Law Association of Japan. I'm very proud of her. Today, they, there are many top post women in Japan, CEO or the academia, anywhere, but the number, sheer number, is still very much limited. So in the company, we have many important posts. We have, we have females, but the sheer number is very much limited. Foreign ministry is very much different. We, all, we destroyed any discrimination against, against gender. So the half of the diplomats in Japan are females. We are called Amazonist ministry in Japan. But this is coming in, and soldiers too. We have to employ girls as soldiers. They don't have to shoot bullets because they can operate planes, drones from the back, from the underground. So many parts we have to, we have to employ the girls and the female labor force. We have to do that. Now, the problem is not the institutions. There's absolutely no hindrance institutionally. This is customs. Men, they have to change their mentalities. 
and it's coming in. And for example, the, the biggest physical uh, handicap for women is when they bear kids, they have to leave post, right, for one year or two years. Governments ask the husbands to take, take, take holidays to help wife. And the, legally, they have rights to take holidays to help the pregnant wife or the raising kids. But not many men take these holidays. Still, it's not yet social custom. But we have to change that. Otherwise, population is not decreasing. We are, we are losing 400,000 Japanese every year. 400,000 every year. We have to cope with that. Otherwise, we can never go up again. So migrants, okay, we are accepting more and more foreigners, workers. 50,000 before Abe. With Abe, 80,000 80, every year. 2.5 million foreign workers in Japan today. It's not a big number in comparison with the whole population, but it's, it's, it's increasing now. Tokyo area, Nakano district, Shinjuku district, in these districts, the young, youngsters more foreigners than Japanese. And the kindergartens in these districts, you can never speak in Japanese because kids don't understand. And the kids don't understand even English. So nurses are using translation machine, Tagalog, Hindu, <laughs> otherwise Swahili, otherwise they can't communicate each other. And this is New Japan, this is coming in. So in this context, the liberation of females are absolute necessity and it's coming in, but I have to say the movement is a bit slow yet. Ambassador Mori. Uh, although my wife doesn't have uh, uh, as much uh, prestigious position <laughs> in, in Japan, but uh, I, I totally agree with Zakanehara-san. And the important thing is uh, uh, when Abe-san comes to the society, he he put the priority of uh, revital, revitalized, revitalizing uh, women's power in Japanese community. And that is what Japanese community, not only the politicians, but also uh, the Japan, Japan society at large should, ha should ha have to address in order to uh, keep up the economy itself in order to get over this uh, very serious issue of aging society in Japan, uh, we need to make the best use of women's power. Uh, and that type of destination uh, is not different in uh, Kishida's government. So uh, it, it, it hasn't changed uh, over the time. And uh, uh, we are pursuing uh, that avenue uh, very seriously. Great. Could we go to the next question uh, in, in person, please? Good afternoon. Thank you so much for sharing. My name is Julina. I am from Singapore. And my question is, it was mentioned in the Shangri-La Dialogue last year that Japan aims to bring new developments to the freedom of the Indo-Pacific and also enhance security via improving bilateral and multilateral relations. My question is, do you think that the increased involvement of Japan in the Indo-Pacific could possibly be viewed by China as a threat? And if so, how do we manage this reaction? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the 10 years ago, China and Japan were the same size. If we say we double the budget militarily, China would say there's a threat. China is now far bigger than Japan, the size of the US almost. Military budget is five times bigger than Japan. So even though we double military budget, it's still 30% of Chinese, Chinese budget. Threat is China, not Japan. We cannot threat Chinese. If we say, we're going to threat Chinese, Chinese laugh at us. Do it, bring it on me. <laughs> That's today's China. China is not huge, the size of the US. We cannot threat Chinese, but China can threat everybody in Asia. That's, that's a physical fact. Ambassador? Uh, same opinion, uh, and the uh, important thing is uh, uh, not only free and open Indo-Pacific uh, concept, but also many other uh, issues Japan and the United States has been trying to consolidate positions of uh, our uh, friend nations, including Singapore, 
or Southeast Asian countries, uh, Australia or India, uh, those countries. And if they feel they are, I mean, China feels that they are um, um, trying to uh, uh, bully uh, China, they should feel uh, threatened. But uh, as uh, Professor Kanehara said, uh, what's, what's been happening is quite opposite. Thank you. There's a sort of related question online. It's could you comment on Japan's naval cap capability strengthening and also recent cooperation discussions with Philippines? Essentially, we've seen, in other words, in Japan since 2007, since Abe, a steady expansion of military uh, capacity, uh, whether it be naval or uh, re rethinking um, from defensive to offensive. And I guess sort of the the follow up question would be: Is is it there any possibility? that from the perspective of either China or North Korea, uh, you could see that as something that you're reacting to or not? Basically, we are reacting to China. Okay. And we don't have to, we do not want to use money for the military if we don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And why should we spend huge amount of money for the military? Simply because China is becoming too big. Their fleet, for example, they, their big boats are now 350, 350 boats. Americans have 300 boats. Japanese have 50 boats. But Americans scatter their boats in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean. We can't cope with the Chinese fleet now. Their missiles and arsenals are huge. And they might take over Taiwan. And they're bullying us over Senkaku Islands, bullying everybody, the Vietnamese and Indonesians, Malaysians and Brunei people in the South China Sea, invading the, the skirmishes are happening in Kashmir, near Bhutan. They're expanding by aggressive measures. And we're simply reacting to that. If we can live in peace with China, we don't have to use money for it. We are very much senior people. We have to use money for the Medicare pension. It's a huge pressure upon us. Why should we use money for the military? If China does not expand the military in this way, we don't do that. Everybody is now reacting to Chinese build up. Okay. We actually are running out of time, but I'll, let's one more, Rachel. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Serena Rachel Ninomi. I'm a senior here at Penn studying international relations and economics. My question kind of goes back to our previous conversation of how Japan's a global power, but also it's a, um, facing a huge budget deficits and, all, and also an aging population. So the concern that a lot of people have is Japan's losing its global power status and in particular losing economic power. What's Japan's reaction to this? What efforts are they making to perhaps maintain their global status or try to maintain as much international presence and um, power or basically more focused on economic power and um, perhaps to maintain such a liberal international order that we've kind of talked about. Thank you. Uh, philosophical question? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, like more, we could, um, more like policy perhaps, like given that Japan's losing perhaps like leverage compared to China and the US who has more bigger market power, how is Japan reacting to that in terms of perhaps building more alliances with like mining countries or what's, Japan's kind of way of coping with the fact that it is losing national presence or global presence. Mr. Uh, Kanahau, be, before, could could we just, could you, do you, we, we're running out of time, but if we could just combine questions, do you have a short question and then just give yours and then we'll get the last one and hopefully you can we combine if that would be okay. Sure, Go thank ahead. Thank you very much for giving me this chance. Uh, uh, my name is Winston Lee. I'm a PhD candidate uh, studying at University of Delaware, uh, researching uh, uh, IR official and Japanese foreign policy. Uh, so my question uh, is about uh, some uh, difference between uh, the Japanese approach to China and the US approach to China. Mm -hmm. I think um, as uh, Mr. Uh, Kanehara mentioned in your opening remark, uh, Abe administration stressed the necessary necessity to engage China, but I think Within the US, there are more debate on whether to in continue engaging China or to move toward a more like balancing strategy. So uh, I, how, uh, so first I want to know how to evaluate uh, Abe's China policy because we, do, we did see some improvements between 
um, Japan-China relations, uh, especially in 2017 and 18, but the US-China relations has been getting worse. Um, and how, also, how do you see some of the difference in those these two countries' approaches toward China? Great. Great. One, one more question, if, if you can. Good afternoon. My name is Dashan. I'm a third year student at Penn here. And my question was, Kanahara-san, you mentioned earlier that Jap in Japanese government, it's very uh, generational based, like each generation has its own kind of policies. So I was wondering, as more and more younger people, like 20, 30, 40 year olds, start entering government positions, do you think that's going to change how Japan's policies are now, from how they, how they are now? Yeah, right. thank you very much. Uh, maybe I could combine the answer for the first and second questions. Japan, the United States approach towards China is not very different. Because one, one we, are, we are developing this liberal order. We're networking and we are making friends, inviting many nations, right? And new industrial democracies. And the, the Americans say the sort of integrated deterrence, integrated deterrence. We say the, the simply engagement of China, but from the position of strength. The, we don't talk about the only military things, the nuclear weapons and intermediate range missiles. We should cover the sort of global, 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 global change of climate, right? Global economic change, climate change. And we have talked about business too. We are now talking about chips industry must be decoupled, but it's only a small part of the whole trade with China. 99% we don't touch it because it's mutually beneficiary. We make money, they make money. What's wrong with it? And our companies go to China, the factories go to China, we are hollowed, but we accept that. And investment investors making money in China. And the value part is very difficult because they don't accept our, legal, our liberal thinking. It's a threat to them. When we say democracy, freedom, freedom is, is, is fine, they say it's threat to our dictatorship. We can't accept it. So we, don't, we can't talk about value part, but we can talk about economic interests. We can talk about global climate change. And we, can, we should talk about the stability security in Asia. And we don't, we don't want to have a war with the Chinese at all. That's devastating for everybody. And this is, the, this is broad spectrum engagement is the Biden's policy. And military is a part of that. And this is American policy today to engage China. And we do the same thing. Our military, part, military, military force is much more limited than the Americans. So, so by combining our national, national power with the Americans, we could engage Chinese. If we don't go with the Americans, we can't engage China, because China make us surrender, because we are, we are weaker than Chinese these days. It's the same for the other nations, ASEAN nations and Europeans, and many nations are now, they, they know that without, the, without being united, China can control us one by one, make us surrender. So that's the reason why we're united. And the, even the, the smaller countries like Lithuania, Czech, Slovak, these nations hate dictatorship because they experienced that with Soviets. They speak out, but we have to raise voice together with them. Otherwise, they are, they are going to, they, they, China, China is going to punish them. Lithuania, they can't export anything to China now. And this kind of things can happen. But when we are united, we are far bigger than China. And we should implement this, uh, this integrated deterrence with China together with other Western powers become small. Then we can engage Chinese. So the, the, the national, national power of Japan is now in decline, of course. That's, that's a fate. That's because American, United States is different because you, you, you accept many migrants every year, one million, right? Illegally, illegally, maybe two millions. And you have different dynamics. But in other Asian countries, Japan peak out and China will peak out soon. And Korea peak out. And the ASEAN nations are coming up very rapidly. Today's ASEAN nations economic size as a whole 
is already 75% of Japan. It's huge. It's bigger than India. And India is already half of half size of Japan. This is the fate of industrialization. You have to you have to swallow it. Market force is cruel. They drive the money investments outside the advanced nations. And then second tier, third tier gets money and they start to be industrialized. This is the market force. We have to accept that. To not to not to fall, you have to break a new train like internet. This is where Japan could not do that, do this. Americans could do that. So you have the internet industry, right? Like the GAFA, far bigger than the uh, big companies 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was Japanese banks and American oil company were the biggest companies on earth. Now they are dwarfed by these internet companies. And this is the only way in which the advanced industrial nations can survive. We have to innovate. If you don't innovate, you're gonna lose. But so in, in a way, precursors are shrinking in proportion and so new ones are coming up. But as far as these liberal nations get together, we can cope with the big ones like China. And China will pick out in some decades. And we can never be communists but they can be like us one day. So this is a long time competition with them. Great, the buzzer has, has sounded, but Ambassador, do you, do you wanna say something uh, maybe to close this out? Okay, in, in a very short lines, all three questions. Uh, first on uh, what, what Japan should do uh, to uh, protect the current position of Japan. Uh, yes, we are uh, bringing together, putting together all possible measures, including uh, innovation, reforms, uh, anything uh, to revitalize Japanese economy. And second, uh, to uh, make presence up uh, in the States or in the world, bringing <clears throat> more active Japanese business to, to the US and vice versa, inviting uh, foreign countries to Japan uh, to show. And thirdly, exchange is very important. We have very few Japanese students here, but we need more Japanese to come here to learn how U.S. is uh, uh, dealing with the issue, and vice versa. We, we do need more of foreign students in Japan to let Japanese young people learn what is, uh, what is the world, uh, what is the problem the world is facing, what is, what is uh, their uh, con uh, contemporary people are thinking about. These are things we are doing. And second question on uh, China, yes, uh, U.S. and Japan has a different history vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and, of course, different geographical locations. So we have different approaches uh, quite naturally. And most obvious case was uh, in 1972 when uh, uh, Washington went to uh, Beijing uh, without uh, Japanese government uh, know, know, knowing. Uh, that was a surprise. So in that, in, in that experience uh, made Japanese people more serious about uh, communication with Washington when it comes to uh, China policy. So we are now in full coordination with uh, Washington, uh, how to deal with uh, China or other East Asian regional issues. And last, uh, younger generation, yes, uh, they will change uh, Japan to uh, the more promising direction, I believe. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, I failed in my effort to try to get you guys to argue against each other, but I did succeed in, in helping to sort of feature a very rich discussion of Japan. So I thank you both gentlemen for your wisdom uh, and your uh, uh, giving us uh, uh, all the uh, sort of background of your full experience. And I hope we can bring you back again uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, before we say uh, goodbye, let me just uh, say that uh, we are part of this World Today program. There, there is one uh, every week. Next week's World Today program will be on the war in Ukraine, another uh, topical uh, discussion. So that will be same time, same place, Tuesday, February 28th. Uh, that's that is at four 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 o'clock. And as always, uh, you can access a recording of this conversation on the Perry Worldhouse uh, YouTube channel, and you can find out about all the great events that Perry Worldhouse has planned for the rest of the semester by visiting uh, the website, uh, joining the mail list, 
and following uh, following Perry Waldhouse on social media. Uh, of course, you can do the same for the Center for East Asian Studies. So I, 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 I urge you to do that for both of our organizations. And thank you all uh, for coming today, uh, for joining us with this rich discussion. Uh, hope to see you in the next time. Thanks very much.